Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, uh, somebody that you should actually follow in uh, social media on Twitter, Tony Nash. He is uh, somebody that you definitely need to uh, need to look for because uh, has very, very interesting ideas. Tony, how are you? Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks so much for having me today. Oh, it's a tremendous pleasure. As I said, I, I, I was very much looking forward to, to have a chat with you. Please introduce yourselves a little bit, yourself, sorry, a little bit to our audience uh, and uh, let us know what, what, is, what is it that you do. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, my name is Tony Nash. I live in Houston, Texas. Um, I've spent actually most of my life outside of the U.S. I spent most of my 20s in Europe, North Europe, the UK, Southern Europe, and from my 30s to almost the end of my 40s, I was in Asia. Um, and so, you know, being in the US, Europe, and Asia has really given me personally an interesting view on things like trade, economics, markets, and so on and so forth. Um, during that time, I was the global head of research for uh, The Economist uh, out of London. Uh, I was based in Singapore at the time, led the global research business. Um, I moved from there to lead um, uh, Asia Consulting for a firm called IHS Market, which is owned by S&P now. Um, and after that, I started my current firm, Complete Intelligence, which is a machine learning platform. We do global markets, currencies, commodities, equity indices, uh, economic uh, concepts. We also do corporate revenue and, and expense forecasting. So we'll automate budgeting for large multinational firms. Wow, amazing, truly amazing. Uh, you probably have a very uh, interesting viewpoint on something that a lot of, uh, of the people that follow us have uh, probably uh, diverging views. Now, the, the, the situation about uh, the impact of algorithms in the market, mm -hmm. the impact of high frequency trading and machines in markets. Mm -hmm. We had a chat uh, a few months ago with a professor at, uh, of uh, the London School of Economics that he used to invite me to his uh, uh, year-end lectures to, to give a, a masterclass. And uh, he mentioned that he was extremely concerned about the almost the rise of the machines. No? Uh, mm -hmm. What is your view on this? Uh, I think, so an algo is not an algo, right? I mean, I, I think a lot of the firms that are using algos to trade are using extremely short-term algorithmic trading, um, say, horizons, okay? So they're looking at very short-term momentum and so on and so forth. And that stuff has been around for 10 plus years. It continues to improve. That's not at all what we do. We do monthly interval forecasts, okay? Um, now, when you talk to, say, an economist, they're looking at traditional, say, univariate and multivariate statistical approaches, which are kind of long-term trendy stuff. It's not necessarily exclusively regression. It gets more sophisticated than that. Um, when we talk to people about machine learning, they assume we're using exclusively those kind of algorithms. It's not the case. There's a mix. We run what's called an ensemble approach. We have some very short-term approaches Mm -hmm. We have some longer term traditional, say, econometric approaches, and then we use a configuration of which approach works best for that asset or that revenue line in a company or that cost line or whatever for that time. So we don't have, let's say, a fixed uh, algo for gold. OK, yeah. our algorithm for the gold price is continually changing based upon what's happening in the market. Markets are not static, right? trade flows, economics, you know, money flows, whatever, they're not static. So we're taking all of that context data in, we're using all of that to understand what's happening in currencies, commodities, and so on, as well as how that's impacting company sales down to say the department or sub-department level. So what we can do with machine learning now is, and, and this is, you know, when you mentioned, should we fear the rise of the machines? We have a, a, um, a very large client right now who has hundreds of people involved in their budgeting process. Um, and it takes them three to four months to do their budgeting process. We've automated that process. It now takes them 72 hours to run their annual budgeting process, okay? So it was millions of dollars of time and resources and, and that sort of thing. 
we've taken them now to do a continuous budgeting process to where we churn it out every month. So the CFO, the head of FP&A, and, and the rest of the, say, business leadership see a refresh forecast every month. Here's the difference with what we do compared to what a lot of traditional forecasters and machine learning people do. We track our error, okay? Yeah. So we will, as of next month, have our error rates for everything we forecast on our platform. You want to know the error for our gold price forecast? It'll be on there. You want to know the error for our corn, crude, you know, JPY, whatever? It's on there. So many of our clients use our um, data for their kind of medium term trades. So they have to know how to hedge that trade, right? right? And so if we have our one three month error rates on there, something like that, it really helps them understand the risk for the time horizon around which they're trading. And so we do the same for enterprises. We, you know, we let them know down to a very detailed level, the error rates in our forecast, because they're taking the risk on what's happening. Right. So we want them to know the error associated with what they're doing, with what we're doing. So coming out of my past at The Economist and, and IHS and so on and so forth, I don't know of anybody else who is being transparent enough to disclose their error rates yeah. to the public on a regular basis. So my hope is that the bigger guys take a cue from what we're doing, that customers demand it from what we're doing and demand that the larger firms disclose their error rates. Because I think what the people who use information services will find is that the error rates for the large firms are pretty terrible. Oh, we know yeah. that they're three to seven times our error rates in yeah. many cases. But we can't talk about that. Uh, no, but, but it's an important know. thing. What you've just mentioned is an important thing because one of the things that is uh, uh, repeated over and over in social media and, and you know, amongst the people that, that follow us is, well, you know, all these predictions from the IMF, from the different uh, uh, international bodies, not the, the IMF, actually, the IMF is probably one of the one that makes uh, smaller mistakes. No? But all of these predictions end up being so aggressively uh, revised. Uh, and uh, that that it's very difficult for people to to trust those, particularly the predictions. No, right. And, um, That's right. And, and one of the things that, for example, uh, when we do nowcasts, you know, in our firm yeah. or when with your clients, that's one of the things that very few people talk about is the margin of error. Is is what right. has been what has been the mistake that we have made in the in that previous. Uh, uh, prediction and, sure. and what have we done to correct it? Because one, right. I, probably you may want to expand on this. Why do you think that the models that are driving these now cast predictions from investment banks in some cases, from international bodies in others, are very rarely revised to mm -hmm. to, to to improve the 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 prediction and the and the predictability. Of the of the figures and the and the data that is being used uh, in, sure. the, in the in the model, it's because the forecasters are not accountable to the traders. Okay, yes. one of the things I love about traders yeah. is they are accountable every single day for their P and L. Yeah, right. Every single day, every minute of every day, they're accountable for their P and L. Forecasters are not accountable to a P and L. So they put together some really interesting, sophisticated model that may not actually work in the real world, right? Yeah. And you look at the forward curves or something like that. I mean, all that stuff is great, but that's not a forecast, yeah. okay? So I, I love traders. I love talking to traders because they are accountable every single day. They make public mistakes. Yeah. And again, this is part of what I love about social media is Traders will put their hypothesis out there. And if they're wong, people will somewhat respectfully make fun of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is great. Not necessarily right? respectfully, but they will. <laughs> In some cases, disrespectfully, right? But this is great. And you know what? Economists and industry forecast, commodity forecasters, these guys have to be accountable as well. I would love it if traders would put forecasters up to the same level of criticism that they do other traders, but they don't. Oh. Don't you find it interesting? I mean, one of the things that I find 
more more intellectually dishonest sometimes now is to hear some of the forecasters say well we've only made a downgrade of one point of, of one percentage point of gdp oh only no only right <laughs> <laughs> it's okay right. yeah. so the, is that we've grown accustomed to this idea that you right. start the year with a prediction of say i don't know uh, 3% uh, growth which goes down to mm, below 2 and that mm-hmm. that doesn't get anybody fired it's sort of like you know right. pretty much average but i think it's very important because um, one of the things, and I want to gather your thoughts about this, one of the things that we get from this is that there is absolutely no analysis of the impact of stimulus packages. For example, right. when you have somebody is announcing a trillion dollar stimulus package that's going to generate a 1% uh, increase in uh, trend line uh, GDP growth. It doesn't. And everybody forgets about it. But the trillion dollars are gone. Right. What is your thought? What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think you know those are related in as much as uh, let's say somebody downgrades GDP by one percent. You know what they're not accounting for. What I think they're not accounting for is uh, let's say the economic impact kind of multiplier, and I say that in quotes for that government spending. Right. Yeah. So in in the old days, you would have. A government spending of say you know 500 billion dollars and and let's say that was on infrastructure traditionally you have a 1.6 multiplier for infrastructure spend yeah so over the next say five years that uh seeps into the economy at a 1.6 times outside so you get a double bang right you get the government spending say one to one impact on um on the economy yeah. then you get a 0.6 times that in other industries, right? But what's actually happened, and Michael Nicoletos does some really good analysis on this for China, for example. Um, he says that for every unit of, say, debt that's taken out in China, which is government debt, right? Um, it takes eight, something like eight units of debt to create one unit of GDP, yeah. okay? So, in China, for example, you don't have an economic multiplier, you have an economic divisor, right? Exactly. So the yeah. more the Chinese government spends, actually, the less GDP grows, which is weird, right? But yeah. it tells me that China is an economy that is begging for a market, a real market, okay, rather than kind of central planning. And you know, you in Europe, I'm sure you're very familiar with the Soviet Union. I studied a lot of that in my undergrad days, very familiar with the impact of central planning. China, there's this illusion that there is no central planning in China, but we're seeing with the kind of blow ups in the financial sector that there is actually central planning in China. Um, and, you know, if you look at the steel sector, you look at commodity consumption, you know, these sorts of things, it's, it's a big factor of China still, right? So, but it's incredibly uh, inefficient spending. It's an incredibly inefficient way. And again, it's a market that is begging for an open economy because they could really grow if they were open, but they're not. They have a captive currency, they have central planning and so on and so forth. Now, I know some of the people watching are gonna say, you've never been to China, you don't understand. Actually, I have. I spent a lot of time in China, okay? I actually advised China's um, economic planners for about a year and a half, uh, almost two years on the Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, so I've been inside the bureaucracy, not at the high levels where they throw nice dinners. I've been in the offices of middle managers for a long time um, within the Chinese central government. So I, I understand how it works and I understand the impact on the economy. Don't you think it's interesting, though, that despite the evidence of what you've just mentioned and uh, how brutal it has been because it's it's multiplied by 10 how many units of debt are required to generate one unit of GDP in a little bit more than a decade, no? Don't you find it frustrating uh, to 
read and hear that what, uh, for example, the United States needs is some sort of central planning like the like the Chinese one, and that uh, uh, in fact uh, the, the developed economies would be much better off if they had the type of uh, uh, intervention from from the government that China has. Sure. Well, it's it's kind of the fait accompli that central bankers bring to the table, right? Yeah. You know, I have a solution. We need to use this solution to bring fill in the blank on desired outcome. Okay. And so when central bankers come to the table, they have there's an inevitability to the solution that they're going to bring. Mm -hmm. And the more we rely on central bankers, the more we rely on centralized planning. And so I've had so many questions over the last several years. Should the US put forward a program like China's Belt and Road program? Okay. We know the US, Europe, you know, the G20, nobody needs that. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because Europe has an open market and great companies that build great infrastructure. The US has an open market. And although European infrastructure companies are better, the US has some pretty good companies that build infrastructure in an open market. So why do we need a Belt and Road program? Why do we need central planning around that? And we can go into a lot of detail about what's wrong with the Belt and Road and why it's not real, okay? Yeah. Um, but um, that type of central planning typically comes with money as, the, um, as kind of the bait to get people to move things, right? Yeah. And so we're already doing that with the Fed. Yeah. And we're already doing that with treasure with uh, money from the treasury, right? Yeah. And if you look at Europe, you're doing it with the ECB. You're doing it with money from finance ministries. Um, uh, the the next question is, uh, you know, does the government start actually taking over industries again, right? And you know, maybe, maybe not. And effectively, in some ways, they kind of are in some cases. And yeah. you know, the real question is, what are the results? Mm -hmm. And I would argue the results are not a multiplier result. They are a divisor result. Absolutely. They, uh, absolutely. It is. We saw it, for example, I think it's I mean, painfully evident in the <clears throat> Juncker plan in yep. Europe or the growth and jobs plan of 2009 that destroyed four and a half million jobs. Yeah, it's not easy to, to achieve this. Um, <laughs> no, you have to try to do that. You have to really, really try, really try. I think that uh, you mentioned a very important factor, which is that uh, central banking brings central planning because uh, central banks present a program of monetary easing of, of uh, uh, monetary policy. And they say, well, we don't do fiscal policy, but they're basically telling you what fiscal policy has to be implemented to the point that their excuse for the lack of results of monetary policy tends to be that the, that the transmission mechanism of monetary policy is not working as it should. Therefore, because the demand for credit is not as much as the supply of money that they have uh, invented, they say, well, how do we fill in the blank? Oh, it has to be government spending. It has to be right. social planning. It has to be so-called infrastructure spending uh, from government. You just mentioned a very important point. There is absolutely no problem to invest in infrastructure. There's never been more demand for a good quality infrastructure projects from private equity, from businesses, right. etc. cetera. No? Uh, but I come back to the point of, of central banks and, and, and a little bit about your view. How does prolonging uh, easing measures and uh, maintaining extremely low rates affect these uh, uh, trends in growth and in these trends in, in, in productivity? Well, um, okay, so what you brought up about central banks and the government as the transmission mechanism is really important. So, you know, low interest rates, ZERP and NERP really bring about an environment where um, central banks have forced private sector banks to fail yeah. as the transmission mechanism, okay? Central banks make money on uh, holding, you know, money overnight. Okay, <laughs> that's it. You know, they're not making money necessarily, or they're not doing it to the, to successfully to impact economies. 
they're not successfully lending out loans because they say it's less risky buying bonds, it's less risky having our money sit with the Fed, it's less risky to do this stuff than it is to loan out money. Of course, it's less risky, right? Um, you know, that goes without saying. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, where we need to go with that is, um, well, getting central banks out of that cycle is going to hurt, okay? Yeah. We cannot, it cannot hurt until, um, well, I would say baby boomers in the West and, and in Northeast Asia, which has a huge baby boomer um, uh, cohort, yeah. until those guys are retired and until their incomes are set, central banks cannot take their foot off the gas because at least in the West, those folks are voters. Very and good. if you take away from the income of that large cohort of voters, then you'll have, I think from their perspective, you'll have chaos for years. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we need to wait until something happens with baby boomers mm -hmm. until central banks and finance ministries or treasuries will kind of get religion. And what will happen is, behind baby boomers is a small cohort generally yes. okay so it's that small cohort who will suffer it's not baby boomers who will suffer right. it's that small cohort who will suffer it's the wealth of that next generation that gen x that will suffer when central banks and finance ministries get religion yes. so we're probably looking at 10 more years five more years of this um and then you'll see kind of um, you know, you know, you remember what a rousing success Jeff Sachs's shock therapy was, right? Yeah, yeah. So of course it wasn't. And it's, you know, but it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt in developed countries in a way that it hasn't hurt for a long time. So that kind of brings, you know, to the discussion, things like uh, soundness of the dollar, soundness of the euro, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there who have this thesis. Um, I think they're a little early on it. Yeah, very so, early, I agree. You know, economists, you know, these sorts of people see it from a macro perspective, but often they come to the conclusion too early. So yes. I think it's a generational type of change that'll happen. And then we start to see if the US wants the dollar to remain preeminent, they're going to have to get religion at the central bank level. They're going to have to get religion at the fiscal level and really start ratcheting down some of the kind of um, free spending uh, disciplines they've had in the past. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost inevitable that you're in a society that is aging, the net present value of bad decisions for the future is uh, too positive for yep. uh, the voters that, uh, that are right now uh, in, with the middle age, you know, in, in, in a, a certain uh, bracket of, of age, me. That's right. No. I, That's I, right. The other day, my students, I see you more as uh, the guys that are going to pay my pension than my students. No, <laughs> so yeah, but it's it's you and me who will be in that age bracket who will pay for it. Absolutely. Right? It's the people who are sixty plus right now who will not pay for it. Yeah. So they'll go through their lives as they have with governments catering to their every need where it's our age that will end up paying for it. So people our age, we need to have hard assets. That's Absolutely. the, you know, when the time comes, we have to have hard assets. Um, I agree with that. It's going to be That is one of, the, one of the mistakes that a lot of the people that follow us are, you know, around, they, they feel that so many of the valuations are so elevated that uh, maybe it's a good time to cash in and simply uh, get rid of hard assets. I say yeah, absolutely the opposite, absolutely the opposite, because you've mentioned a very important thing, which is this religious aspect no? uh, that, we've, that we've gotten into. And I, I For just for clarity, would you care to explain for people what that means? Uh, because When I say get religion, I mean uh, to become disciplined. Absolutely. You know, like you that's become. Because that is an important thing. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody, but to become disciplined about 
the financial environment and about the monetary environment. Absolutely. You know, so because that's one of what, the things yeah. that people tend to believe when you talk about religion and the the, the uh, state pl state planners religion and uh, and and central bank's religion is actually the opposite <laughs> so mm -hmm. i wanted to right. for you to very make it very clear that what you're talking about is discipline you're not talking about the idea of going full blown mmt and and that kind of thing mm -hmm. no i think if there is if there is kind of an mmt period i think it's a I don't think it's an extended period. I think it's a, I think it's an experiment that a couple of countries undertake. Yeah. I think it's problematic for them, and I think they try to find a way to come back. But how do you um, come back from that? Because one of the problems that I find when when people bring the idea of, well, you know, why not try? It? No, I always, I'm very aware and very concerned about that. Uh, thought process because you know I've been very uh, involved in uh, analyzing and in helping businesses in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Brazil, and and it's very difficult to come back. I had a yeah. discussion yesterday with the ex minister of economy of uh, Uruguay, and uh, uh, Ignacio was telling me uh, we started with a hundred and thirty three percent inflation, mm -hmm. and we were successful in bringing it down to 40 <laughs> and that was yeah. nine years right so yeah I, I get how do you come back from it look at argentina look at zimbabwe you know i think you know of course they're not the fed they're not you know the eu but they are very interesting experiments when people said we're going to get unhinged with our spending <clears throat> and we're going to completely disregard fundamentals which I would say, I would argue we are on some level disregarding fundamentals today, but it's completely, you know, divorced from reality. Yeah. And if you take a large economy like the U.S. and go MMT, it would take a very long time to come back. So, so let's let's look at a place like China. OK, so so has China gone MMT? Actually, not really, but their bank lending is has grown five times faster than the US. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, these guys are not lending on anything near fundamentals. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, when I say five times faster, what I mean is this, it grew five times larger than the bank lending in the US. Okay. So China is a smaller economy. And banks have balance sheets that are five times larger than banks in the US. And that is a that should be distressing to followers to that everybody. Say that the example of China doesn't work because more debt because it's um, it's because it's uh, growing faster. What you've just said is absolutely critical for for some of our followers. Hmm? Right. The other part about China is they don't have a convertible currency. Yeah. So they can do whatever they want to control their currency value while they grow their bank balance sheets. And it's just it's it's just wonderland. You know, it's not re it's not reality. So if that were to happen, um, there are guys out there like Mike Green and others who look at a severe devaluation of CNY. Um, and I think that's I think that's that's more likely than not. Yeah, uh, obviously, as well. I think that the, the the Chinese government is trying to postpone as much as it can the devaluation of the currency, uh, based on a view that uh, the imbalances of the economy can be sort of managed through central planning. But what ends up happening is that you're basically just postponing the inevitable and getting right. to a situation in which the actual devaluation, when it happens, is much larger. No, it reminds me very much. And I come back to the point of Argentina with the with the fake peg of the peso to the dollar. Yep. That right. they pro prolonging it created a devastation from which they have not returned yet. Right. And if you look at China right now, they need uh, commodities desperately. Yeah. Okay. Metals. They need energy desperately and so on and so forth. So they've known this for months. So they've had CNY at about 6364 to the dollar, which is very strong. Um, and it was trading. Uh, a year ago, around seven or something like that. So they've appreciated it dramatically. 
And the longer they keep it at this level, the more difficult it's going to be on the other side. Yeah. And they know it. These are not stupid people, but they understand that um, that buying commodities is more important for their economy today. Because if people in China are cold this winter and they don't have enough nat gas and coal, then it's going to be a very difficult time in the spring for the government. And when you and coming back to that point, there's a double edged sword. On the one side, you have a currency that is artificially appreciated. On the other side, you also have price controls because coal prices are uh limited by the by the government uh and therefore you're creating on the one hand a very big monetary hole and on the other hand a very big financial hole in the companies that are selling at a loss that's true but i, I would say um one slight adjustment to that things like electricity prices are controlled when power generators buy coal they buy that in a spot market yeah okay So coal prices have been rising where electricity prices are highly regulated by the government. This is why we've seen blackouts and brownouts and power outages in China and why it's impacted their manufacturing base because they're buying coal in a spot market and then they're having to sell it at a much lower price in the retail market. And so the, again, this is the problem with central planning. This is the problem with kind of partial liberalization of markets. You liberalize the coal price, but you keep the electricity price regulated. And you, you know, if you don't have um, the central government supporting those uh, power plants, they just blow up all over the place. And, and we've seen the power generators in the UK go bankrupt. We saw some here in Texas go bankrupt a couple of years ago because of disparities like that. And you know, those power generators in the UK going bankrupt, that's the market working, right? Yeah. So we need to see that in China as well. Yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a very, very fascinating conversation because um, on the other hand, uh, for example, in Europe right now with the energy shortage, we're seeing that a few countries, Spain, France, etc., are actually trying to convince the European Union, the European Commission, to try to uh, get into a, into a sort of intervened market price in the, in the generation business, which, which would be, uh, just like you've mentioned, an absolute atrocity, no? Very, very dangerous, very dangerous. This creates a huge liability for the government. It creates a massive liability for the government. This is a key point that people fail to understand. The debate in the European Union is that, oh, it's a great idea because uh, France uh, has this massive uh, utility company that is public and therefore there's no risk. It had to be bailed out twice by the taxpayers. Right. People tend to forget that you're paying for that. No. But again, this is... What's that block of voters who doesn't really care about the impact 10 or 20 years down the road? That's yeah. the problem is there's a huge block of voters who don't really care what the cost is because, you know, the government's going to borrow money, long-term debt, and it's going to be paid back in 10 or 20 years. And so, you know, the biggest beneficiaries of this and the people on fixed incomes, they actually don't care what the cost is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, there's there's this uh, fantastic perverse incentive to pass the bill to the next generation. And that obviously is where we are right now. No? Uh, coming back to the point of the infrastructure plans and the, and the Belt and Road plan, what, what, what in your view are the, the lessons that we must have learned or that we should be learning from the Belt and Road Initiative? So here's the problem with the Belt and Road. And I, I had a uh, very candid discussion with a senior official within China's NDRC in probably 2015, which was early on. Okay. Um, and this person told me the following. Uh, they said, um, the Belt and Road was designed to be a debt financed uh, plan. Yeah. What's happening now, and again, this was six or seven years ago, very early on in the, in the Belt and Road days, they said the beneficiary countries 
are pushing back and forcing us to take equity in yeah. this infrastructure. Okay. Now, why does that matter? Well, the initial build out of infrastructure is about 5% of the lifetime cost of that asset. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you're, if, if China is only involved in the initial build out, they're taking their 5%, it's a loan and they get out. Yeah. Okay. Um, if they're equity holders in that, let's say they're 49% equity holders in an Indonesian high-speed rail, then they become accountable for part of that build-out, okay? And then they have to maintain the other 95% of the cost for the next 30 to 50 years, okay? Yeah. So they thought they were going to be one and done, in and out. We do this infrastructure, we get out, they owe us money, and it's you know really clean. What's happened is they've had to get involved in the equity uh, of those assets. And so um, I've since had some uh, government officials from say Africa ask me, what do we do with the Belt and Road with China? Very simple answer, force them to convert the debt to equity, okay? Yeah. They become long-term involved, long, on a long-term basis, they become involved in those assets and then they're, you know, they're, they have a different level of interest in them in the quality and maintenance and everything else, but they're also on the long-term basis accountable for the costs. So they don't just build a pretty airport that, and I'm not saying this necessarily happens, but they don't just build a pretty airport that falls apart in five years, okay? Yeah. They then have to think about the long-term impacts and long-term maintenance costs of that airport, right? Yeah. And so, but the, you know, the original design of the Belt and Road was debt financing, yeah, um, mobilizing workers and so on and so forth. What it's become is a mix of debt and equity financing. And that's not what the Chinese government has wanted. So I've been telling people for three or four years, the Belt and Road is dead. Okay. Yeah. And people push back at me and say, no, it's not, you know, think tank people or whatever, but they don't understand the fundamental fact of how the Belt and Road was designed. Yeah. It was designed as a one and done debt financed infrastructure build out, it's become a long-term investment all around the world. So it's a different program. It's failed, okay? They're not gonna make the money they thought. Yes, they'll keep some workers busy, but they're not gonna make the money they thought. All of those assets, almost all those assets are financed in US dollars, okay? Yeah. So they're not getting their currency out. Um, you know, it's not becoming an international unit like they had hoped. Um, they're, it's not, they're not clean transactions and so on and so forth. So, so this is what's happened with the Belt and Road. So the lesson learned is they should have planned better yeah. uh, and they should have had a better answer to you become an equity owner. Um, and uh, I think, you know, if any Western governments want to have kind of a Belt and Road type of initiative, they're going to have to uh, contend with the demand from some of these countries that they become equity owners. And I think that's a bad idea for Western governments to be equity owners in infrastructure assets. Absolutely. So, you know, this is, this is the problem. Japanese have taken a little bit different uh, because of where the yen is and because of where interest rates are in Japan. Japanese have basically uh, had kind of zero interest or close to zero interest on the infrastructure they've built out. And so um, they haven't gone after it as aggressively as China has. Um, they've had a much cleaner um, structure to those agreements. Um, and so they've been, I think, pretty successful in staying out of the equity game and staying more focused on the debt financing for, uh, for their infrastructure initiatives. No, oh, absolutely. Big lesson. Big lesson there, because uh, the we see now that the vast majority of those projects are impossible to, uh, the debt is, is impossible to be repaid. There's about $600 billion of, of uh, unpayable debt uh, out there. And we also have the example from, from the internationalization of the French, Spanish, Italian companies into Latin America, that they fell into the same trap, no? They started with a, with a debt for Financed infrastructure build type of uh, clean slate uh, program that ended up owning equity and yep. in some cases with nationalizations. Hopefully yep. that will not be the, and Daniel, will not be the end. Yeah. Watch for, watch for debt, to, debt to equity conversions 
in these things, it's good. There's going to be huge pressure um, because the Chinese uh, say the Exim Bank, the CDB, you know, a lot of these uh, organizations are going to be forced to convert that debt to equity and then unload it on operating companies in China. Um, they're not going to want to do it, but we're going to start to see more and more pressure there over the next couple of years. Great. Well, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that that will happen. Uh, Tony, we've we've uh, run out of time. Uh, so uh, it's been an incredible conversation. Lots of things that are very, very interesting for our followers. Uh, we will give all the details to follow you and to and right. to get more information about your company in the details of the uh, of the video. And thank you so much for your time. I hope that thank you, Daniel, that we will be able to talk uh, again in a not too distant future. Anytime. Thank thing. you so much, and thank you for your insight. Have a good Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my channel, like my videos, leave your comments below, and. Keep defending freedom. Thank you very much.